Good evening, folks. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm here with Pastor Harry, and we are here for part two of what we started last week on Wednesday night. Yeah. Why did the law come before Jesus? What? Why did Jesus show up even before the law showed up? Uh, why did we have to have the law first? I mean, God arranged creation in a certain uh, um, specific uh, flow. You know, there was day one, day two, day three, and there were certain things that happened. And, and God is mindful of the processes that being important and timely. And so, obviously, God knew the law had to come before Jesus came. Yeah. And so we're, we're looking and investigating that uh, in our study. And so last week, we basically came to a conclusion that we needed to understand what we needed to be saved from. Mm -hmm. That we were on a course of death. And that the law finally showed mankind that there was... Uh, uh, a death that we were going to experience that we didn't know about. Before the law came, man just kind of lived however he wanted to, and God nearly destroyed mankind except saved through Noah mankind and his children. Uh, but before that, it, God said, the thoughts of man are continually evil. Uh, <laughs> and so God said, I, I relent that I've made mankind. And he he destroyed mankind except for Noah. And so we... So on that thought, there was like nearly a thousand years, like or a little more than a thousand years actually, yeah. from Adam and Eve until the flood. You know, and there was many, many, many years and generations of people where they became more and more evil. Yeah. You know, they, they slowly cast off restraint. Well, they thought, hey, we'll build a, we'll build a tower and you know, get to God on, the, on our tower that we have built, you know, that we can make. And, and, and God said, this isn't right, you know. It's a, they've, they've wandered off from serving and honoring us, and, and, and we are the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're the only ones who know the, the optimum performance of mankind, what, what best suits, how man will best operate, and... And mankind was not in that place of wanting to follow God. Some did. Enoch did. Uh, obviously, we see Abraham did. Uh, his father, Terah, we talked about him two weeks ago, about how he kind of turned away and left with his son, Abraham. The scripture tells us he was an idol worshiper. Yep. And, yeah. uh, but God called him and his family and to, to go... Separate. Yeah, yeah. So to leave where they were and go mm -hmm. to a land that he was going to show them. Right. And and he did. That was a big act of faith. It, it definitely was. And so so we see that when man is left to himself, we would destroy ourselves. Without the law, we would not treat one another the way that we should. We would live selfishly. You know, people say, well, man's basically good. He just needs to be educated. That's not true. Man's sinful. I mean, put two toddlers in a playpen with one toy. I guarantee there's going to be a fight. Yeah. I was thinking about it earlier, like with my kids. Yeah. If I tell them to go clean your room, you know, it, it takes some urging. It's not usually first <laughs> first, no. first request. But once they get in there, you know, they're, they're, they will insist it's clean. I picked everything up. I can be like, so if I go in there and I find, you know, any of your possessions, I can just, I can have them because you're not claiming them. You know, throw them away, put them in a garbage bag. Yeah, things like that. And they'll be like, oh yeah, everything's cleaned up. Yeah. And I go in, and yeah, maybe the middle of the floor is clean. You know, and, and there's stuff scattered maybe around the edges of the room, stuff under the bed, <laughs> things like on their bed. You know, but they kind of cleaned up the center area. Yeah. And I kind of feel like that's like mankind trying to be good. Well, it's exactly what Cain pulled, tried to pull on God. You know, he killed his brother, and God said so. Where's your brother? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Yeah, you my know? kids do that too. Well, that's not my toy. <laughs> I didn't put that toy there. Exactly. Yeah. That's the nature of man. You know, as we, we try to do as little as we have to do. Yeah. You know, we don't want to be responsible. And so God brought the law into being so that we would be able to live to the very optimum of what we could be with one another. Um, you know, the Bible tells us that 
that we're not to covet, we're not to slander, we're not to lie, we're not to steal. Um, you know, we, we, we need to operate in a certain context of structure that's good and wholesome for us. That's what the law taught us. And before the law was given, man did what was whatever he wanted to do. And, and uh, it's important for us to realize is the law came as a teacher. Uh, there's a scripture that, that, let me read it to you. This is found... Uh, let me see. I have it down here in Galatians. Um, this is chapter 3, verse 19. Why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the me agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. That was Jesus. Now, a mediator is not for one part only, Whereas God is only one, it is the law. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would have indeed been based on the law. But the law has shut up everyone under sin, so that the promises, or the promise by faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody. Under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed, therefore the law became our tutor or teacher to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. Now, but now that law, the, rather, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, for you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And so the law was a teacher. It instructed us on what we were to do that honored God. Uh, man uh, left to himself doesn't bother about what pleases other people. We don't think that way. You know, uh, little Johnny likes little Susie in first, second, third grade, and what happens? Does he treat her right? No. He pulls her hair, you know, un unties the bow on her dress. He trips her, you know. He, he, My wife said I still do that. <laughs> <laughs> Grow up, David. <laughs> And, and that's what we do because we're immature. But then we begin to grow and we're taught standards and laws. No, you don't do that to a girl. And, and suddenly, little Johnny and little Susie, they're, they're teenagers in high school. And, and, and now Johnny wants to win her love, not test her love. And, you know, when we're immature, we want to test love. Do you love me even when I do this? And, and that's just the way that mankind is. You know, God, if you really love me, you'd do this for me type thing. I, I guess I can be childish now and then. <laughs> yeah. they you know, just now and then. A couple weeks ago. Except and, you humble yourself as a child. You cannot enter the kingdom. Yeah. Of a, that's your license. Yeah. A, a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> Angeline told me, I've got to go to the bathroom really bad. But she got distracted by the kids, you know, walking through the house. And I ran past her, ran over to the bathroom, turned the light on and the fan on and closed the door. And then I ran into the kitchen. <laughs> And then she got to the bathroom, and she's like, damn it, I got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and I stuck my head around the corner and, and laughed. And she was yeah, like, I've done the same thing. <laughs> so the thing is, is God, <laughs> you're terrible. You're as bad as me. We really have to pray for our wives, don't we? We do. So the thing is, is the law came to train us, to help us to understand what the heart of God was towards us and what he desired from us. It, it wasn't there to beat us up it was there to help us to come to the place of saying oh god desires this and so we start operating to win god's love not test it and you know the law helps us to come to the point also to realize i can't do it on my own i there's no way i can keep every law and the revelation of that weighed on the hearts of the people of israel where they longed for a deliverer, you know? When they said Hosanna, when Jesus entered into the city, it basically was a, a, a cry for help. It was save us. That's really what Hosanna means. Yeah, yeah. They, they needed to find a different way. They saw that the pharisaical laws and the judgments, they weren't working. And so they cried out. Here was this teacher who came and he taught with authority he taught with grace. He taught with sharing God's love. And they said, we want that because the law doesn't have that. It's, 
It's a taskmaster. Yeah, you know, one of the things that always struck me about that was when Jesus came in, um, the, the, there were famous rabbis that they, they in, interpreted the law. Some of them were great teachers, and mm -hmm. so they became, they became well-known, you know, and they, they spent their lives trying to interpret the law and figure out what it meant. Mm -hmm. And But when Jesus showed up, Jesus, when Jesus spoke to them, he was able to say, this is what it means, yeah. and, and this is what I want you to do. Yeah. A totally different way of looking at things. And Jesus came in, and, and he began to uh, release to people uh, in a, a way to please God. Yeah. And whereas before, they were just speculating, really, about what can we do to please maybe God. Maybe if you do this, or maybe if you do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the woman caught in the very act of, very act of adultery, they said the law says this, she should be stoned to death. And what did Jesus do? He extended to her grace. Mm -hmm. To the point where everybody left, and Jesus said, where are your accusers? Mm -hmm. And she said, no one here, Lord. And she was looking at Jesus, and Jesus was not accusing her. And so it opened up the people's eyes. This is the heart of God. This is what God desires. And so the law brought us to that desperateness of saying there's got to be something that will that will take care of this. What do I need to do? And and it's a good thing. You know, if if I have an illness and I keep denying it and denying it, a lot of times that illness will, will be dormant for a season, but then it'll start to get worse. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll get pain. And that pain leads me to, man, I got to do something about this. It's like a sore tooth, you know? Yeah. If I know that I got a tooth that, eh, something's going on with it, but I ignore it and I put it off for five, six months, but then I wake up and I've got this unbearable toothache, I do something about it because I don't like the pain. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so, so I take care of it. It's interesting that there are infections of the mouth that can cause heart problems. We had a lady in our church that appeared she was having a heart attack. They took her to the hospital, they put her in the hospital, they ran some tests, and after a day and a half they found out it's an infection in her tooth that's causing her heart to have problems. Yeah, that's amazing. So they got wow. that under control. And so, so many times, if we're left to ourselves, we go, oh, I'm okay, you know, nothing's wrong, but let the pain come, and then we go, man, I gotta do something about this. And the law brings us to this painful conclusion I need to be made right with God. What can I do? And it's it's the letter of the law that brings to us a revelation. We're dead, and we need to do something about it. And so what God does is he now says, here's what the law says, here's the consequence, but here's what I've given to pay that consequence, and this is what you can receive as a free gift. And what a wonderful thing that God does through the law. If if Jesus would have come before the law was given, it would be like like a, a kid who had rich parents that was, and the parents said, here, here's an inheritance that will take care of you the rest of your life. That kid would not have any sense of appreciation for what the parents did. Yeah. They'd just go, whoo, okay, man. I'm, and just like the prodigal son, go out and blow it. <laughs> yeah, and go out and party. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it's such good news about what Jesus did. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what Jesus came to do was to preach the good news uh, and and uh, he came and removed in essence the requirements of us following the law mm -hmm. um, by by showing us a better way and then making us able to do it by giving us his holy spirit and that, oh amen i was just going to say that and the wonderful thing is is we have the person of the holy spirit constantly in us every thought yeah. every consideration the holy spirit's going Go for it. Do it. That's the right thing. Or, nope, you might yeah. want to th rethink that. <laughs> yeah, so the Holy Spirit helps us now. In fact, the, the Scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit is the one that convicts the world of sin. And, and yeah. uh, you know, like, sometimes we think that's our job. You no, know, it's not our job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Mm -hmm. He's the one that convicts them of righteousness and judgment, let, letting them know in their be innermost being that they're doing the wrong thing and they're on the wrong track. And mm -hmm. then... Um, so he uses us, you know, to help welcome them into the, the kingdom of heaven and the family. And maybe we can yeah. be an example to show them how to walk in righteousness. And mm -hmm. they, we can also be an example to show them how when we royally mess up, 
how, how to how to find how the to grace recover. of God. Yeah, <laughs> and and uh, a couple chapters later in Romans, in Romans chapter seven, he says, um, "For while we were in the flesh, the sinful pla- passions which were aroused by the law mm-hmm. were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death." And that's that's really interesting to me, you know. Like the the law, you know. Have, have you ever like been told not to do something? Mm-hmm. And so then, what, what do you want to do? do? What do you mean I can't do that? I'm going to do that. You can't tell me what to do. <laughs> Let me tell you a quick story. <laughs> there was a hotel down in Florida, and for years, you know, the the, the balconies uh, of the it was like I don't know ten stories or what, and the the balconies overlooked. It was right on the edge of the ocean. It was a beautiful area. And um, for years, you know, the, the people enjoyed the balconies. Well, it was bought out by a corporation. The lawyers came in and went, there's going to be people trying to fish off of that balcony. So what did they do is they put signs in all of the balcony rooms saying no fishing off of the balcony. Guess what people started doing? <laughs> I've never heard of somebody doing something like that, but because they put signs up, it made people want to do oh, it. yeah. Let's try that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And Satan comes along and says, but you can't do that. And we go, yeah. oh, yeah, I can do that, you know. And, and we're egged on by our flesh, the passions of our flesh, to do these things. But, but the law is given to say, don't do that. It'll hurt somebody else. It'll hurt you. And if we, if we listen to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we go, no, I'm not going to do that. But now, since we've accepted Jesus, our motivation is no longer keeping the law. Our motivation is wanting to please God. And the Holy Spirit says, you don't want to do that. And we go, you know, you're right. I, I don't want to do that. I, I used to do those stupid things. And now I want to live a better way. And it, it motivates us to change how we live. Our motivation yeah. now, like Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And quite frankly, the, the end of chapter 7 that you were reading in, I mean, Paul was lamenting. Those things I don't want to do, I do. And those things that I want to do, I don't do. Wretched man, who will deliver me from this body of sin or flesh? You know, yeah, And yeah. then he goes right into Romans chapter 8 and says, Wow, in Christ Jesus, we're not condemned. No, we're not. Hallelujah. You know, the next verse after what I read, I read verse 5 of chapter 7. The next verse is, is real encouraging. It says, But now we've been released from the law. Yeah. So there was the law that made us that stirred, really stirred up sin in us yeah. and showed us the, the sin that we're, that we're trapped in. But now we've been released from that law, having died to that which we were bound. And he, he's identifying there that as Jesus died on the cross to abolish sin, when we begin following him, we, in a sense, die with him to the former sin. So we've been released from the law. We've, been di- we've died to that sin so that we serve in the newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. And think about that. that that's, that's such good news because we couldn't live up to the letter of the law. So now there's a newness of the spirit of God that we're able to follow uh, that will lead us in something that we can do. Righteousness that we can achieve with the help of the Holy Spirit. The law exposes in us sin. Mm-hmm. Before the law came, we didn't know what the sin was. Yeah. We just thought, oh, this is what I feel like doing. You know, yeah. and we did it. You know, what little kid, you know, why'd you do that? I don't know. I mean, my son <laughs> used to do that. We, we had the Zorro uh, um, actions. You know, John, little Johnny, about three years old, got a razor knife. And he's, he was Zorroing everything, man. Seat cushions, his T-shirt, his table the table uh, cover, the curtain, our couch. We came in and, Johnny, how'd this happen? I don't know. (laughs) Why'd you do this? I don't know. And he really, he was three years old. It was like, oh, here's a knife. Let me see what it'll do. You know, he didn't even think about it harming himself. Thank God he didn't, he didn't do anything, but he picked up the razor knife, opened it up, and started cutting things because, oh, that's cool. It'll Mm -hmm. do this. Yeah. And, And that's, that's, that's sin. It takes occasion of our flesh and the curiosity, wanting to know good and evil, that, that whole thing. And what, what the law does, it says, you've got sin. It's like, it's like in the natural, going to the doctors, we don't feel good. 
and we go in and the doctor says, you've got cancer. Well, let's do something about this. And so, you know, they, uh, and there's so many advances today that they, they pretty much have beaten cancer, much of it. There's still some things, but chemotherapy, radiation treatment, surgery. Yeah, especially if they catch it early. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So there's, so there's ways to deal with the cancer of sin, and that way is through Jesus Christ. The law came to expose to us the reality of the sin nature. You know, yeah. what a privilege it is, David, for you and I and the opportunities we've had where we've been able to help people come to a conclusion that, oh, I've got sin in my life. Mm, yeah. And and you said Jesus paid for my sin that I can be freed, and and what a wonderful blessing to be able to pray with people to receive Jesus, and the sense of of release of burden that we see in their life. Many times yeah. I'll ask people, I, they'll accept Jesus, and right after I'll say, so how do you feel right now? And they'll go, Wow, I I I don't feel the burden. You know, I I feel happy. I feel. I feel joy and I feel peace. And it's that radical when we accept what Christ has done on the cross, how it affects us physiologically and emotionally, how it sets us free. And what a wonderful blessing that is to be able to do that. Oh, it is. It, um, a little bit later in Romans, in Romans chapter 8, you, you, you mentioned uh, verse 1 where he mm -hmm. condemns sin, right? Um, well, verse three it says, "God's done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do." Yeah, you know that that's really what this comes down to is that that the law was given to to expose our sin, and in our flesh, and the law itself was perfect, but in the flesh, it it, it couldn't it couldn't transform us. You know, the other thing about the law is the authority of the law. You know, if I come to you, David, and I say, David, that's wrong, you. You would, you would in the flesh go, who says? Are you telling me that you're better than me? You know, I mean, it oh, would yeah. be that type of a thing. Yeah. It would be that ramping up of, I don't need to listen to you. Who mm -hmm. do you think you are? That type of thing. But if I say, David, that's wrong. God says this in his word. All of a sudden, there's a greater authority that's mm -hmm. being expressed to you that it isn't my opinion. It's God's law. And the wonderful thing is, is as we share with people, that what God says, there is a conviction, like you said earlier, that the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin and unrighteousness. Suddenly, there's that authority of God that begins to wait on them. That, that's true. And the good news is that Jesus condemns sin in the flesh. Yes, he does. So so he, he made it possible for us to overcome sin yeah. with, with his help. Um, he came and he did it himself because he lived a perfect life. And now we're able to follow in his footsteps and he can begin to free us from the control of sin, which is one of the topics that shows up in Romans, mm -hmm. is that we're no longer under the dominion or the rule of sin. We've died to it. Yeah, it, it doesn't control us anymore. Yeah. Um, I guess unless we let it, yeah. you know, and, and if we listen to what sin tells us to do, then we're letting it control us. But if we listen to what the Spirit tells us to mm -hmm. do, then we're letting God control us, and he frees us from sin. Yeah, the power of sin is broken through Jesus. But yeah. We can say no. We don't, yeah. You know, before, it was like, yeah, okay, yeah, maybe I'll do that. But now we say, no, I'm yeah. not doing that. Yeah. In so, Jesus' name, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, so we've been released from the law. So because of what Jesus did, and we, we die with Jesus, so to speak, and so we've died to that thing that held us captive. So now we're able to serve God in the spirit, you know, and that, that really, it changes things. We don't walk according to the passions and the desires of our flesh. We, we walk according to the spirit. Yeah, we've, we've died to the power of sin. We, we no longer have the sin nature um, uh, operating in our life. We now operate in a spirit nature. However... It's a choice. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it, it's interesting to me. Like, you know, I, I see speculations, especially on Facebook. You, you get to see, uh, if you look for it, everybody's <clears throat> uh, questions about everything, right? You know, and, and you, see, you see things popping up where people are like, well, 
you know, wh why why did mankind, you know, if God if God's real, why why does why is there still sin? You know, why is there bad things in the world? If if God's plan is real, then why didn't He just make things so that the fall of man would never happen? Or why why didn't He just do this to fix it five thousand years ago or something like that? You know, and 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 I don't pretend to have a, a full grasp or comprehension. I don't think any man does no. of of that. Of, of the real answers to that but some of the things that 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 I have thought of it, and even as we're talking today I've, I've been pondering it when Adam and Eve were given the garden that they were like that prodigal son in a sense you know you, you mentioned earlier that they were just given this wonderful gift mm -hmm. they didn't have to do anything to earn it mm -hmm. and it came to a point where where somebody you know Satan or the, the serpent through Satan's influence suggested well maybe god's withholding things from you maybe there's more better mm -hmm. things that he has that you could have right. if you ate from that tree he told you to leave alone mm -hmm. you know and and they didn't appreciate it you know and and they they fell and now mankind has, has gone through this process of of struggling with discovering what sin was and, and what our need for God is and what effects of sin. Yeah, and we're walking through this process. Figuring of, out we're living in a pig pen. Yeah. There's that correlation. But very much so, <laughs> just like the prodigal son. Yeah. Where the prodigal son took the wealth of his father and uh, went into a foreign land and lived large and blew all the money partying yeah. and uh, came to the point where he was literally living in a pig pen mm -hmm. be, uh, in, in a mess of his own creating. Yeah. And, and comes to this thought, well, I'm taking care of this guy's pigs and I don't even have enough food to eat. I'm eating the pig's food. Um, maybe maybe if I go back, I can I can work for my father and he'll take care of me. And, and he returns home and the father brings him back in to his family and gives him a place in his household again. And I, I, I wonder if that prodigal son appreciated the relationship with his father and, and his duty as a son in a new way after that. I bet he did. And that's the same thing that happens for us. If if mankind hadn't gone through uh, the fall and, and the effects of sin and the discovering salvation in Jesus and having to make the choice to follow him and then walk through the process of choosing to follow him even afterwards um, and struggling with sin that's trying to come in and, and regain, reassert its dominion, you know, us rejecting that. Like, we're walking through this process where we're being trained and developed uh, by the Holy Spirit to be mm -hmm. sons of God and to yeah. choose to follow God rather than choose to follow sin. And at, at, at the end of the day, there's going to be an appreciation and, uh, and, and resilience and resolve that we have that we never would have had before if it had just been popped in our lap. You know, I, I think what God did and I'm speculating here in my opinions, folks. But God, because of his understanding of what true love is, made sure that man had a choice. Yeah. And, you know, we lament, why did God give man a choice? Well, because God wanted a true, bona fide love relationship with us. One that was not based on, you know, I guess I love God, you know, but one says, I yes, I love God because of what he's done for me. And it, it, it causes us to see this contrast of choosing, you know. We can choose to live life without God or choose to live life with God. It's our choice. And because of that, we begin to appreciate and understand the choice that we have. Life is all about choice, folks. It's it's choosing, like like uh, Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And, and I think that, if anything, the law brought us to a conclusion that said, here's what my life is like, here's what my life can be like, what am I going to do? And so we can turn God off, in a sense, we can turn a deaf ear to him, or we can become very aware of the heart of God and what he desires for us. I I so appreciate uh, God's wisdom in helping mankind come to the place of being able to appreciate life with God. You know, if, 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 if we were created and the garden experience would be ours for, for all of eternity without ever knowing 
um, that there was a choice that we had to make. Um, I, I don't know if we would really understand what it means to serve God with our whole heart. Uh, mm, yeah. I, I like what the what the last part of these verses that we've been looking at. We didn't even read the portion of scripture. <laughs> Well, I think, oh, that's right. We read it last yeah, week. We read, that was last week. You guys will have to go back and read the last <laughs> Hey, we're doing Romans chapter 5, verses 10 through 21. So if you want to yeah. if you want to read that. Yeah. But basically, <laughs> verse 20 and 21, it says, The law came in so that the transgression would increase. And you could go, what? Well, then why had the law come in? Well, it's because the law showed us the nature of sin. It showed us we had spiritual cancer. It showed us we needed to do something about it. It but stirred it goes the pot up. and brought up the muck so yeah. we can see it. But where sin increases, grace abounds all the more. Hallelujah. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life. So so we were given a bigger understanding that this life isn't it. This, this life doesn't end with death, which is what the law says and sin says. It's over. This is done. But, but what the grace of God does, what the, what the righteousness of God says is, oh, no, there's so much more. There's eternal life with me. And, and heaven would not be heaven if we went there without making a choice to love God. Yeah. It, it, it just changes the mindset of us as human beings where we no longer live for ourselves, but we live for God, for others. It, it changes our nature because the sin nature has been killed, hallelujah, through Jesus Christ. We're dead to sin, folks. That's exciting. I mean, we still wrestle with this body of flesh, but we now have the power of choice to say, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. Hallelujah. Amen. That's that's such good news. We we have the ability to not be controlled by sin anymore. Yep. That's we have right. the ability to look forward to a, an eternity with God mm -hmm. where where he's able to look at us and, and say, Well done. Yeah. And and wow. say, Good and faithful servant. Yeah. And even though we don't really truly even deserve him to say that because of, of who we've been and even how we continue to slip up. Sure. You know, uh, he looks at us and, and sees our striving to follow him and to please him and all of that uh, to the point where one day in eternity he's going to look at us and say, well, well done. You know, and that to me is something worth striving for. And uh, on, on top of all of that, you know, I, I want to live a life now that's not ruled by sin, not ruled by struggle, you know, personal, you know, inner struggle, but I, I want to live a life that's able to, to follow God. So how much we need the help of the Holy Spirit? Oh, amen. How much? And, and I, I realized at one point in my life, a number of years ago, that I needed the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I, I'd probably been saved for uh, maybe a year or so since I started following Jesus. And I, I just realized that in my own flesh I was weak, and I, I, I needed the help of the Holy Spirit. And I, I started uh, praying and pursuing uh, uh, God to, to give the baptism of the Holy Spirit to me. So he even, like, uh, he did, you know. And, and not only do we have the Holy Spirit as, as believers, but he gives us the baptism of the Holy Spirit on top of that. And I always think about it like this, like, like, uh, um, if you can drink a, a glass of water or a bottle of water, I mean, God, God has poured the Holy Spirit into us mm. um, when we've been saved. But when we become baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's like like we begin we, we become immersed in the river of the Holy Spirit flowing, and, and He carries us where He wills, like the current of a river. Yeah. And to me, that's the difference in the Holy Spirit, where we we or the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where we yield our will. And allow the Holy Spirit to carry us where He wills, which that's obedience, folks. Mm -hmm. And we we let Him use us in what ways that He desires. And to me, like that is the greatest desire of my life is is to be available to go where God wills, mm -hmm. and to not not be uh, anchored by my flesh, you know, and the desires, the passions, you know, of of life, but rather to have the passions of God fill my heart, you know, and and so. I want to encourage you folks that the way to beat sin 
it is is to have a super heavy dose of the Holy Spirit yeah. every day. <laughs> yeah. As much as you possibly can is to spend time in the presence of the Holy Spirit, reading the Word of God, praying, talking to God, worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. Mm -hmm. Let that be a daily rhythm of your life because uh, that's what Jesus came to do. Mm -hmm. Mankind couldn't follow the law. So he came to give us the Holy Spirit to, to free us from the dominion by, by uh, forgiveness that happened when he went to the cross and the justification that he gave us by justifying us and making us right with God. And he gave us the Holy Spirit to help us to walk in a new way. And I want to encourage you to walk in a new way and let the Holy Spirit lead you. Yeah, I, I, you said something earlier about, you know, as we walk, even if we fall, you know, even though we, we don't walk as we need to. You know, God is for us. He's not against us. And, and there's a great hope that we have because of the love of God being given to us and understanding his intent and purpose for us. That's right. I like, I like what David says in this psalm. And he says this. This is Psalm 37, verse 23 and 24. This is David who fell, you know, who wrote Psalm 51, created me a clean heart, O oh God, renew a right spirit within me, cast me not away from, you know, this was, this was the man that was, was uh, confronted about his sin by Nathan the prophet, and, and yet here he writes in Psalm t in 37, 23 and 24, the steps of a man are established by the Lord, and he, God, delights in his way. You know, as we allow the established steps that God gives to us to take, when we walk in those things, he goes, that's my son. Look. Mm -hmm. Hey, Gabriel, Michael, look at, look at my son. Look, look how he's walking. Look at my daughter, how she's walking, you know. And, and he delights when we walk in the ways that he's established for us. But verse 24 says, when he falls, which, folks, we still have this stink of the flesh. And there are times when we will sometimes stumble or fall. And it's, it, we don't have to, but we, because of living in this world, we might. We might get angry at our spouse, excuse me, angry at somebody that's poking along on the highway when we got to be someplace, somebody that cuts us off, somebody that's rude and does something rude to us. You know, I mean, uh, you know, there are still times that, that we, uh, the flesh rears up, and it might cause us to fall for a season. But it says this, when he falls... He will not be hurled headlong. And that word hurled headlong means to be cast out, to be thrown aside. It isn't like the parent goes, that's it, you're done. You fell. I'm not going to help you, you know, walk again. I mean, what parent in their right mind when a, when a kid's learning how to walk and they stumble and fall, we go, that's it. I'm not going to ever help you again and try to figure out how to walk. No, the parents are, come on, you can do it. Get up, get up. He goes on to say, when he falls, he will not be hurled headlong because the Lord is the one who holds his hand. Amen. Amen. God is good. And so, so you know, Adam, or Adam and Eve hid from God. They ran away from God. And after we accept Jesus, we, we pray a prayer of God. Any hidden thing, let it be exposed to you. Here, God, I want to hold your hand. You know, mm -hmm. and we... And we walk with him and we begin to appreciate his loving intentions towards us to where when we do fall, the Holy Spirit is quick to help us to go, oh God, forgive me for what I've done. Please help me to serve you better. And, and, and basically, we reach up to grab God's hand, which pleases God. You know, he, what, what one of us as a parent, you know, wants our kid to go, running out on a dock that, you know, is 30 feet to the ocean, you know, no, hold my hand. You're holding my hand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you don't understand the dangers here. Hold yeah, my hand. Yeah. And and what parent doesn't delight when that child says, I'm afraid here, hold my hand, you know, and we go, oh, no problem, I can hold your hand. I don't know a parent that said, no, I don't want to hold your hand, you know. It's, yeah. It, yeah. We, we delight in that, and God is like that to us. He He longs for us. Not to run away from him, but to run to him and ask for his help. Amen. So, it's time to pray. It is. And, I, you know, the best way to walk in this world is with is holding God's hand. 
And, and he sent the Holy Spirit to hold your hand. Yeah. And to, and to show you the way. And, and we're going to pray for you. And, and I, what what better way can we pray than to ask the Holy Spirit to, to minister to people and to mm-hmm. speak to their hearts and yeah. and to uh, to literally fill them yeah. with it, with His presence and and so that He can be the one that, that teaches you the ways of God. Yeah. And so I just want to ask you just to open your hearts to the Holy Spirit. Um, if if you've never known how to hear the Holy Spirit or follow the Holy Spirit, just pray along with us. Mm-hmm. We're going to ask Him to teach you. And, and uh, I, I pray that, that you're going to begin to discover uh, a new journey of, of discovering the ways of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Well, so, Father God, we come to you now. Hallelujah. And uh, thank you, you for Lord. sending the Holy Spirit you are to show us your ways. Cool. And I pray I that so. you would speak mm-hmm. to people's hearts right now. Yes. That you would, yes, you would help to break down a- anything that's uh, raising itself up mm-hmm. against the knowledge of God, yes. um, anything that's preventing people from knowing you, that you would begin to tear those things down yes. and, and to resolve those concerns in their spirit and in mm-hmm. their mind, that you would resolve them and, and ultimately remove them to make room for the Holy Spirit yes. and to open up the pathway for the Holy Spirit to flow through their lives. Amen. And Lord, just right now, as people are, are looking to you, I, I ask that the, the presence of the living God would descend upon them and rest upon them and flow through their lives and, and immerse them in your spirit. I pray that you would uh, even baptize people in the spirit as they're mm-hmm. listening. Yes. Lord. And that people would hear from you mm-hmm. and that they would they would come to know the ways of God Almighty through uh, listening and, and being led by the Holy Spirit. Yes. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you that that's been your motivation towards us from when you made us. And uh, how we ran and hid our faces from you, not understanding your ways. And, and Lord, uh, how we ignored the law. And the law was to lead us to the point of realizing we had something that was deadly in our life that we needed to have healed, that we needed to have uh, worked out of our life. Thank you for pursuing us and helping us to come to the place of saying, God, I need you. I want you. Please forgive me. And I accept what Jesus did on the cross, payment for my sins. And Lord, I pray for that one that is still trying to figure out who you are, that you would show yourself to them, that you are a loving God. Your desire is to to show them your, your careful love, your nurturing love, and that they can trust you with their whole life, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Holy Spirit that you help us to know and grow in understanding the heart of God and his love for us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, folks, thanks for joining us. God bless you. And uh, we hope to see you next week. Amen. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.